This is the 11th in a series on an overview of the Bible. Today's lesson will be about the church. The thought occurs to me that I've stressed an overview so much you may feel like I am opposed to studying any kind of technical truth. Why, that's not true at all. Uh, snow is beautiful on a mountaintop, but it's also beautiful under a microscope. And everything which God creates is that way. Now that which man makes is just the opposite. The more closely you examine a piece of cloth, you magnify that a thousand times, it becomes something ugly. A picture which is beautiful from across the room reveals many brush marks and imperfections when it is seen closely. But the truths of God, the more closely you examine them, the more beautiful they become. So I'm not denying the existence of minute technical truths in the Bible. It's filled with them. But the thing I want you to see is the broad overview, for I'm convinced that most people have never even read the Bible. And as we've said before, the vast majority of the people in our world do not have a Bible to read. Now, I want to talk to you about something very, very close to my heart. Back in 1973, I determined to write a book on church government. And I began studying all the technical data that I could find to present lessons on the church. Here were some of my preconceptions. I knew that the church had to be separate from idolatry because the Bible teaches, come out from among them and be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I knew the church had to be evangelistic. Jesus commissioned his apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I knew that they baptized by immersion because immersion was a baptism. It was like a death and a burial and a resurrection, Romans chapter 6. I knew that they studied the scriptures. I knew that each congregation had elders and deacons. I knew that there were restrictions on women in these early churches, that they were not permitted to teach or to usurp authority over the man. I felt that they were strong on tithing and strong on prayer and etc. Then it dawned upon me that my view of the early church was very much like the synagogue. As a matter of fact, Everything which I have listed here on this blackboard was true not only of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also of the Jewish synagogue. For example, the Jewish people were separate from idolatry. They, hadn't been an, they had not been actively involved in worshiping graven images since the Babylonian captivity. The Jewish synagogue was evangelistic. They compassed sea and land to make proselytes. Of course, when they were made... Jesus said, they were twofold more the child of hell than those who converted them. They had converted the chief women of Adia, uh, the queen of Adiabene, and there were Jewish synagogues throughout the Mediterranean world. They were very evangelistic. It is not well known, but it is nonetheless a fact that they also baptized by immersion. There was proselyte baptism. Now, baptism by immersion to a Jew was no big thing because in front of the Jewish temple, there was a molten sea. It was on 12 bronze oxen, and it contained 18 or 20,000 gallons of water, and they dipped all the time. So when converts were made to Judaism, they received a proselyte baptism by immersion. The Jewish synagogue met every seventh day. Now, the early church met on the first day of the week, but the Jewish synagogue met to study the scriptures, and they had elders who met strict qualifications in those synagogues, and also deacons, or as they were sometimes called, almoners, who cared for the poor. They also had restrictions on women in the Jewish synagogue. They also were strong on tithing. They even paid tithes of mint, anise, and cumin. They were strong on prayer, would even stand out on the street corner and pray to be seen of men. And Jesus said, you're familiar with this, but you're not familiar with what I'm going to teach you. And to compare these two would be like putting new wine in old skins or new cloth in an old garment. There was a radical difference. The diff one difference, at least, was this, a matter of emphasis. All truths are equally true, but not all truths are equally important. Two plus two is four. Jesus is the Christ. One's just as true as the other, but one is not as important as the other. There's an old story about the late Charles Schwab that he once paid $25,000 for eight words of advice. Those eight words were, do things in the order of their importance. 
That's good advice for anyone. That's good advice for a surgeon in the emergency room of your local hospital. That's good advice for the financier or the housewife. That's also good advice for the Christian. I had a young man come to me some time ago who was ministering in a small church of only 18 or 20 people. He said, we've got a big problem in our church. I said, well, what is it? He said, we have a woman teaching a man's Sunday school class, and according to my understanding of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, that's wrong. I said, well, all truths are equally true, but not all truths are equally important. Now, you step back and get an overview of your church, only 18 people in attendance. Is that the major problem that needs to be attacked at this point in time? Is that the most important thing? I predict if you attack that problem, you won't have 18 people to minister to. You'll probably have just two or three because that poor woman didn't even want to teach the class, I'm assuming, but there wasn't anybody else to do it. And therefore, in the real world in which we live, priorities are of tremendous significance and importance. Now, I want to show you a map of the Mediterranean world and talk about the limited view of the apostles of our Lord. They were men who had never, never traveled outside of Palestine. There are expressions coming out of the Caribbean that say that people who have limited vision have a small island mentality. This came home to me when I found out about a certain woman who had lived 50 years on Grand Cayman Island, never been off that island. It's only 21 miles long, and the highest promontory on the entire island, the biggest mountain, is only 35 feet above sea level. Her vision was so limited. She had a small island mentality because she had no way of seeing or knowing anything else. The apostles of our Lord, unfortunately, had a small island mentality. And when Jesus commanded them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, or as Matthew's gospel puts it, all nations, that meant Gentiles. They were commanded by Jesus to preach to Gentiles, but they didn't understand that. Their minds and their vision was too limited. So um, for the next 20 years, they preached to none but Jews only. That's what they did in Jerusalem, and when they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen, they still preached the word to none but Jews only. The Lord said, well, Peter, you preach to the Jews. I'm going to now uh, cause you to preach to the Gentiles. And it took a series of miracles. They are recorded in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. It took a series of miracles where Peter had this vision and that, and it was repeated three times, and all these unusual providential things came to convince Peter that of a truth God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation him that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable. But even then, Peter was not willing to go preach to the Gentiles as God had commanded him, and according to Galatians chapter 2, he gave to Barnabas and Saul the right hands of fellowship, saying, you go and preach to the heathen, and I'm going to go preach to the circumcision. And fortunately, before the apostles died, they all did exactly what Jesus commanded them to do. They went out into all the world and preached the gospel to every creature. All historical data points to that. But the person, I think, that God used to change their minds was a bold and aggressive thinker by the name of the apostle Paul. He, well... He was initially known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a man who thought big. When he began persecuting the church, he didn't think little. He didn't just think in a narrow parochial way. He went to the high priest and got letters of authority to go as far away as Damascus. He was going to do it in a big way. And of all things, God chose him, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, the most legalistic man of his day, to be an apostle to the Gentile. That's why the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus to appoint him a minister and a witness, not only of the things which Jesus had already revealed to him, but which he would reveal. And he was going to witness before governors and kings, and he was sent specifically as an apostle to the Gentiles. The Pharisee of the Pharisees was sent as an apostle to the Gentiles, and he immediately grasped that vision. The disciples were not called Christians first in Jerusalem. Because unfortunately, the Jerusalem church did not catch that vision. The first integrated church in the world was the church at Antioch in Syria. 
That's where the Apostle Paul was. The church had quite a leadership. They're mentioned in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts and the first verse. There were five men at Antioch who were prophets and teachers. They were Barnabas, Lucius, Manion, Simeon, and Saul. Each of these men had something, some kind of an important input into the leadership of that church. Here was Barnabas, who was a man uh, who had, uh, well, he was from the island of Cyprus. He had traveled a great deal. He was a man with a very compassionate heart, and while he was at Antioch, a great many people were being added to the Lord. Then there was Simon, who was a black man. Simon called Niger, which means black. He gave additional insight and input into the leadership of that church. Then there was Lucius of Cyrene, a man who had come from North Africa. He had a totally different perspective than these other men do. Uh, to a lot of us, you know, five or ten dollars is a lot of money, but to people who are involved in government, they speak in terms of millions and billions, where the average householder speaks in terms of hundreds of dollars. And then there was, of course, Saul of Tarsus. And while these men ministered to the Lord and fasted and prayed, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And then we find Paul went on three missionary journeys, and his fourth missionary journey is not called by some as a missionary journey because he went as a prisoner to Rome. One of the big problems which he faced as they preached the gospel in the first century was the very problem which you and I face in our congregation. It was a problem sometimes of people not wanting to love other people. The Jewish people wanted to love their fellow Jews, but they did not want to love the Gentiles. And there was a very serious danger in the first century that there would be two churches instead of one a Jewish church from Jerusalem, and a Gentile church which had its headquarters in Antioch. The problem was so serious that even as late as AD 57, which was approximately the time that the Apostle Paul wrote the Roman letter, late as AD 57, he wasn't sure that money taken for the poor saints in Judea would even be accepted by the Jewish church. In Romans chapter 15, we find that from Jerusalem, round about unto Illyricum, Paul had fully preached the gospel. In only 10 years' time, he had evangelized the entire area. Now he was ready to go to Rome, but before he did, he had to take money to the poor saints in Judea. And he asked the Romans to pray for him that I may be delivered from them which do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. That to me is an incredible verse. The apostle had traveled throughout the Mediterranean world. He had gone to Galatia and given them orders to receive money on the first day of the week for the poor saints in Judea. He had gone to Macedonia and Achaia and given them instructions, receive money for the poor saints in Judea. But the feelings of prejudice in Judea were so strong against Gentiles, he was not even certain that this money would be accepted. So he wrote to the Romans in about AD 57 and said, you pray for me that I may be delivered from these men who really don't believe and also that my service, this money I'm collecting, will be accepted of the saints. Now, a few years later, Paul was a prisoner in Rome, and he wrote four letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And I'm happy to say that the hesitancy which he had manifested in his Roman letter had disappeared. Now he spoke with certainty in these prison letters that the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile had been broken down and that God had made of the two one new man so making peace. One of the beautiful truths from the Bible which helps to make this kind of unity possible is the doctrine of mercy. The scriptures teach, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Do you know where that verse is found? The place where it's found is very, very important. It's found in the book of Hosea. Now, according to Jewish law, a Jewish priest could not marry a prostitute. But Hosea was a prophet, and he was commanded, according to the first chapter of the book of Hosea, to take a wife of whoredoms in the land of whoredoms with children of whoredoms. His wife, Gomer, did not deserve to be saved 
She did not deserve to be redeemed. She did not deserve to be loved. But God loved her anyhow. And Hosea 6 and 6 says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice from you. The Jewish priests could not show mercy. They were forbidden by law to show mercy. Levi, from which the Levitical priesthood comes, was, I think, a very cruel man. Back in the 34th chapter of the book of Genesis, we read that his sister was raped by a Hivite prince. And Simeon and Levi, with subtlety, talked these men into the rite of circumcision. And then on the third day after they had been circumcised, when they were too sore to defend themselves, Simeon and Levi went into their camp and massacred every man and carried away the women and children. When the law was given on Mount Sinai, Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? We've got an orgy. We've got people who are dancing before a golden calf and profaning and blaspheming the name of God. Who's on the Lord's side? The Levites said, we're on the Lord's side. And they were commanded to go through the camp with their swords and kill every man his neighbor, every man his companion, and every man his brother. Can you imagine what it would be like to kill your brother or your neighbor or your companion? The Levitical priest would stand before an altar and cut animals' throats all day long. When the temple was dedicated, the Levitical priest sacrificed 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. Day by day, year by year, literally millions of innocent victims were murdered and there was no mercy shown. But Jesus was not a Levitical priest. He didn't come from the tribe of Levi. He could not be a priest according to law. His priesthood transcended the Levitical priesthood. And the Bible teaches he, had a, he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was superior to that because Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek and Levi was yet in the loins of his father Abram at that time. Jesus is a merciful priest. And we come unto him boldly without any fear or trepidation that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And the crying need in our churches is for mercy. All truths are equally true, but not all truths are equally important. I don't know what particular denomination you belong to, but I well imagine that there are one or two things that really stand out about your denomination. When you think of some denominations, you might think of holiness. Other denominations, you might think of grace. Other denominations, you might think of some clerical order or some particular doctrine which that denomination teaches. All truths are equally true, and I'm not denying the truth that your denomination is founded around. I'm only saying that Jesus told his disciples, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Let me share with you from the book of Romans. Rome was like a political hub to the ancient world. Uh, there was the lawyer with his technicalities. There were the native Romans with his gross materialism and his overpowering desire for world domination. There were Greeks there with their love of speculation and philosophy, vanity and pleasure. There were barbarians and Scythians and people from all over the Mediterranean world who had come to Rome, and it was a melting pot of races and of creeds and of nationalities. Now, you can imagine in a congregation like that with so many different people from so many different backgrounds that there would be a lot of reason to argue, a lot of different views of Scripture. And so in the 12th chapter of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul tries to get these people to love one another. That was the most important thing in that congregation was harmony and love. So he said, let love be without hypocrisy. Be kindly affectioned one to another. I'm not going to read every verse, but I want to just give you a feel for the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Distribute to the necessity of the saints. Be given to hospitality. Bless them that persecute you. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. Recompense to no man evil for evil, and provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. As it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Do not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that's God's teaching to the Romans. Harmony, peace, love, forgiveness. In the 13th chapter, 
we discover that they were not to owe anybody anything but to love one another. For he that loveth fulfills the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. In the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, he talks about people perhaps from Jerusalem who felt like it was wrong to eat meats. Him that is weak in the faith receive, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who are you that judges another man's servant? The 14th chapter talks again about peace and harmony and following after love. In the 15th chapter, we are told that those of us who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. That's the golden rule. We must love our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves. And Christ is given as an example. He didn't please himself. As it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In the 16th chapter, Paul knew some people would not pay attention to him. He knew that there would be some people for whatever reason who would want to legalistically split and divide the body of Jesus Christ. So he wrote in Romans chapter 16, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses among you contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. They that are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. I want you to be merciful, because I'm convinced that God is merciful. The 136th Psalm has always had special reverence and meaning for me. I was at the hospital with a close friend named Arlie Kolaw. Arlie was dying. I, he was in a coma, and I didn't know whether he could understand or not. So I said, Arlie, I'm just going to read to you. And I was reading through the Psalms at that particular time. And as I was reading the 136th Psalm, Arlie Kola passed into eternity. Is God merciful? Listen to this Psalm and decide for yourself. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he's good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. With a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divided the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever. And Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever, and gave their land for an heritage, for his mercy endureth forever. Even an heritage unto Israel his servant, for his mercy endureth forever, who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies, for his mercy endureth forever, who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endureth to ever, forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endureth forever. I have a radio program on a 30,000-watt FM station. 
It's an interview type program, and I think one of the most memorable people I've ever interviewed was Ella Jo Sadler. She wrote a book called Murder in the Afternoon. At the time I met her, it was sold out of its third printing. The story was this. When she was 16 years of age, she and her parents were in their home with her best friend. When two young men came to the door with a shotgun, they had caused her father to lie down upon the floor and murdered him in cold blood. They turned the gun upon Ella Joe's mother, shot her twice, once on the shoulder, which, as I recall, shot off one or two fingers of her left hand at the same time, shot her in the back of the head. Then, since they didn't have any more bullets or shells for the shotgun, they began beating these girls. They beat one girl to death, Ella Joe's best friend, and they beat her to the point of death, and she was unconscious for three weeks. Ella Jo said, as I thought about this experience, I was just filled with hatred and bitterness and anger. And I always saw myself with Jesus and those terrible murders far, far away. And then one day, I had a vision or a dream. And I saw Jesus far, far away, and I was in the same category as those murderers. I was a sinner too. I needed mercy just like they needed mercy. And the only way that I could get mercy was by giving it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. May you be filled with mercy, is my prayer.